I wish to thank Deborah for her energy to organize this, and she has a fantastic quality. She does great, great introductions for the people who come and speak here, so I can only disappoint you after this. The presentation we saw before about those fantastic leaders who are there to inspire made me think of humankind, our civilization. Our civilization is actually an orchestra, isn't it? It's an orchestra of dreams, of imagination, of effort, of intelligence, but more intelligence, it's actually dreams. It's the dreams and the inspiration we get from different sources that have, has, has made our civilization exceptional in the space, in the universe that, that we know at the moment. Because I heard that a couple of weeks ago they found 56 planets that are identical to ours, so we may be in for a surprise. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, what do you think Einstein, Louis Pasteur, and who else do we have up there? Michelangelo have in common. They lived in very different times and they were in very different, they work in very different eras. But they have certainly, if not more, two elements in common. And that is innovation. They were innovators in their field. They changed the paradigms of their field. They introduced new things. They changed the way we live. They changed the way we appreciate art. And secondly, they were driven by inspiration, not science, not logic. They were driven by inspiration. If this works, we'll have a look. Whoops. Let's have a look at inspiration and Einstein. If you ask a uh, seven-year-old child to stick a picture of a scientist on their scrapbook, go on the internet, Google, they're really good at it, better than I am. Google pictures, too. First scientist that comes up is the man with the big hair, sunglasses and a white lab coat. And that's the picture that goes on the scrapbook. Actually, Einstein did not conduct any experiments. Einstein was in the realm of the Greek philosophers. He was an armchair philosopher. The proper word is that Einstein was a theorist. And the theory of relativity was not proved in his time. In fact, there are still some proofs coming around. Einstein developed the theory of relativity with an inspiration he had when he was 16 years old, which is an age you know, much lower than the audience today. We all were watches. Um, <laughs> At 16 years old, Einstein was sitting down and he, said, he thought, you know, 16, you're still very energetic, you still think of running. Um, and he said, okay, I'm, I'm standing here, or sitting here, and light, a beam of light is whizzing past me. And this is the foundation of the theory of relativity. Now, if I speed up and I start running and running and I reach the speed of light, and I look at that wave of light going, at the edge. This, this, this thought came to him at the end of the 1800s, and the idea of, wave, of light being a wave was, was uh, quite popular then, or at least with, with his uh, uh, part, um, colleagues. And he said, if I look at the wave of light, I'll see this wave. And if I'm fast enough, the wave will actually slow down, and me and the wave will be in sync, and all I see is trough and, and peak, and nothing is moving. If we're moving in perfect harmony, if we're moving at the sp same speed, we will have a, a notion that we are standing still. Are you standing still, Alex? Are you standing still, Christine? Are you standing still, Amanda? Are we standing still? Are we? No, we're not. So that's just a perception. Okay, so we have a civilization that gave us more information. If we asked that question 2,000 years ago, or let's go a little bit further back, the answer would have been probably yes. But now we know we're hurtling through space together. So basically, that is the whole basis of the theory of uh, relativity. Movement, space, and time is all relative. Uh, we are, we think we're in the same uh, place, and we think we're standing still, but we're actually moving very fast. Now, to somebody who's moving much faster than the speed of the Earth, maybe we will be stationary. What Einstein is trying to tell us there, there is with the total experiment of chasing a beam of light, at the age of, this, of 16, he had this gut feeling that there was something about the universe we live in. And he spent the rest of the, the, uh, his life pursuing that inspiration and coming up with the beautiful theories and the contributions that he made to physics. Now, interestingly, his first paper was written in 1905, and it is notoriously famous for doing exactly the opposite that we tell our students in their dissertation. He had no references and no acknowledgments. You know. 
and we fret about the full stops and the commas in our references. Now, there's one person he didn't reference, and it was this gentleman, Henri Poincaré. Henri Poincaré actually influenced Einstein, and before Einstein died, he felt a little bit guilty. And he said, the father of the theory of relativity is Henri Poincaré, because in 1900, he wrote a seminal paper on our, uh, our perspective of synchronicity. You know, they like to talk in big words. Basically, Henri Poincaré was obsessed with two things. Events happening at the same time and spheres for some reason. A few of them are on the screen there. Firstly, in the 1900 paper, Henri Poincaré said, you know, how do we know that an activity is, two activities are happening at the same time? So in, my, in the traffic jam this morning, you know, going through Valley Road, traffic completely stopped. I was thinking of Henri Poincaré, so he probably thought about something like this. How do I know that my carriage, because he was in the 1800s, and that carriage crossing each other are crossing each other at the same time? You know, look, observe, and it's happening at the same time. But his mind worked on a different level. He was thinking, what if that event of one carriage was being observed by a star millions of miles away, and the event of the other carriage crossing was being observed by another star more than many millions, millions of miles away? How could they measure that that event was happening at the same time? So he went, again, he spent a great part of his life experiment, uh, not experimenting, but theorizing on this. And he came up, he, he believed very strongly that our perception of time and events when they take place, again, is purely a matter of perspective. It depends where you're looking at things from. And purely a matter of relativity, which influenced Einstein. Now, you know why I like uh, quoting Henri Poincaré? Because besides the wonderful things of theory, uh, relative, um, theory of relativity that he influenced, he also influenced Pixar. What's Pixar? <laughs> Toy Story, I think, because they keep changing their name, don't they? Um, it's this wonderful company that brings us fantastic graphics. Now, you would think that, uh, Pixar to be ju uh, you know, just uh, a, a production company, but it has a fantastic layer of mathematicians in it working on three-dimensional objects and how to draw spheres, how to draw legs, how to draw heads, how to draw fingers. I mean, Michelangelo struggled with fingers, and he was famous because he managed to draw the hand so well. These people are doing it on, on, on screens in a flat surface, and it takes a lot of mathematics to be able to design those 3D images on a flat screen. And Henri Poincaré has influenced something called the visual, visual dimensionality by the inspiration, the questions he drew, he drew through the mathematical community. We're talking about 1900 when he, when, when he was at his peak. And one of his conjectures, he threw a puzzle to the mathematical community 100 years ago. And I believed it was solved somewhere, somewhere uh, uh, around the year. Uh, there was actually a millennium prize. One million pounds were offered if you could solve the uh, Henri Poincaré conjecture. And somebody actually did it, because it's amazing the inspiration we get from a million pounds. <laughs> And the conjecture said, if you have a sphere, he didn't call it a sphere, he called it a two-sphere or something like that. If you have a sphere, if you have an object, he said, and if on this object you have something, I'm going to translate it in the way I like to understand it. If you have a rubber band and you wrap it around a, an object, and this rubber band can be shrunk, 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 shrunk to any one point, then that could indicate that that is a sphere. Now, we would think, you know, that's extremely exciting. Thank you very much for that concept. Um, but actually, it is extremely exciting for anyone doing animation in 2D and 3D. And that is the basis of many, much of the software that we see around. There is such a term called Pixar mathematics today on the visualization and three-dimensional imaging, which is more or less inspired by, by one of these theories. Now, We've spoken about two theorists, because they weren't really kind of experimental scientists. Uh, Einstein and, uh, and Henri Poincaré were, were not seen in labs. They were mainly seen, you know, kind of theorizing and philosophizing. And now we can talk about people who actually spent most of their lives in laboratories. Louis Pasteur. Next time you eat a Maltese Chbena, think of me. 
Louis Pasteur is famous for saying in very eloquent French, which I won't desecrate today because I have great respect to the language and my French is rather rusty. He said, in experimentation, chance favors the prepared mind. And when we're training our students to write dissertations, the first thing they say is, do we have to write a literature review? And I empathize, it would be the most boring part of your very creative and innovative dissertation. We always quote this, chance favors a prepared mind. You study what other people have done 2,000, 1,000, 10 years ago, because it opens your mind to opportunity. It can actually inform great discoveries that you can come up with. And that's what Louis Pasteur is talking about there. And he was speaking from experience. He was saying that great discoveries happen not when you determine them. And somebody spoke about this this morning, didn't they? Uh -huh. uh, Ken Robinson said, our life is not linear. Our life is organic. Things happen, they flow from one thing to another. And Louis Pasteur is encouraging us to think the same. Our successes are organic. They are spurred by un, un, uh, unexpected events. And it's the, uh, our ability to see the invisible, our ability to see an opportunity that nobody else can see that makes us great. Now, what happened to Louis Pasteur? He had a very sloppy uh, lab assistant. He was really bored of working with chickens and frogs. And all he had to do all week long is inoculate chickens with fresh cholera bacteria. I mean, what a job. I can imagine in the morning waking up saying, I'm really looking forward to doing this. So sloppy assistant inoculates the chickens with uh, uh, quite dead uh, cholera bacteria because he picked up a very old culture by mistake. Henri Poincaré finds out, you know, goes into a rage, says, you have to fix this problem. And a uh, sloppy assistant comes back and inoculates the same chickens three days later with a fresh back batch of cholera bacteria. Now, surprise, surprise, those chickens, unlike, unlike many other poor, poor chickens, uh, survived. Um, now, uh, Pasteur could have kind of uh, just overlooked that, but he didn't. He said, why did they survive? They survived because they had kind of a, a, a soft start of a disease and they could uh, combat it. And they, and they built up the immunity. And that was the whole basis. Like the, the light traveling for Einstein was the basis of relativity, this was the whole basis of microbiology and our concept of inoculation and our practice of inoculation, which again has been instrumental to the population growth and to the lack of deaths in our civilization. Let's look at another science, science uh, innovate, innovation and discovery that came about by chance. Rontgen, father of the X-rays, didn't even try to invent X-rays. He was experimenting with a discharge tube and a uh, screen coated with barium and was trying electrons on the, on the screen. He uh, you know, forgot about the experiment running and reached over on his desk where this experiment was running and he got the shock of his life. For the first time, he saw the, his bones through his screen being reflected on the, uh, on the screen. Um, now, what he saw was nothing like what we're seeing on the screen now. That is uh, an x-ray, a rendering, there, there's computer graphics, there are many things in it. Um, what he saw was a faint shadow, but it was enough for him to recognize this huge opportunity. Another great discovery, we have a nervous system in us, an, elect an electronic circuit running throughout our bodies that enable us to communicate and do these wonderful things. Again, how was it discovered? Galvani was a biologist. He is one of the greatest contributors to electronics, which happened quite by chance. He was dissecting frogs' legs, a hobby at that time. And uh, he had many of them. They seem to grow very large where he comes from. And he threaded a series of frogs' legs and hung them in this beautiful uh, Italian balcony made of, uh, made of iron. Uh, and they were there just to dry out before the dissections occur. Now, uh, a gust of wind came along and uh, flicked the frog's legs, and he was noticing that every time the legs touched the iron balcony, they jolted. 
a little bit like a reflex, but you know it wasn't a reflex, nobody was hitting the knee, and they talked. Again, he had a prepared mind. His, eye, his mind was open to innovation. His mind was open to seeing what other people cannot see. And he said, whoa, we must have an electric current. Frogs must have an electric current running through their, through their uh, physiognomy. And that was the start of his contribution to the field of electronics. In fact, there are things like galvanometer called after him and uh, units of, of electricity. Now, what is interesting is that, uh, you know, occasions like this where people actually jump out of their field and contribute in an era that they didn't expect. As, a, as academics, we are, to, we are told to focus, to stay in our field, to become specialists, which is fantastic. But there's a, no, there's a new movement coming around which is saying um, you are allowed to broaden your horizons and look at other fields. And when you do that, you may become another Galvani, where you can step into another field and make an astounding discovery. Now, the, reasons, the reason why academics usually don't move from one field to the other is sheer fear. Sheer fear of being made to look stupid. Um, but I'm going to be a little bit daring now. My students may be thinking why I'm going out, you know, so much out of my field, because my field isn't biology or electricity or the theory of relativity. My interest is in uh, really boring, uh, something called network economics, innovation diffusion, innovation patterns. I love looking at patterns of innovation. And let's do a leap. Let's be a little bit brave. So, area of interest, innovation diffusion and ICT networks, basically, why are mobile phones and why social networks and why Yahoo and Google and Microsoft are, so, are such fantastic money-making machines and have given such a fantastic contribution to society? Let's make the leap. There are intuitive links uh, between genes and ICT networks. The number of different cells in our bodies is about the square root of the number of genes. And this is replicated in any species. <coughs> so, if you take a dog or a cat, it's the same thing. The number of different cells in their bodies is the square root of the species genes. Mm, as soon as I see a square root, I, get, I start getting very excited, you know, because I'm that sort of person. Um, <coughs> When I saw that, I thought, oh my goodness, so genes must be a telecommunication system. That, of course, is not a proven thing. That is an intuitive thing that I'm feeling. Again, that gut feeling, that inspiration. And maybe somebody will work on it in the next 50 years and say, you know, she wasn't precisely correct, but it made me think of this, and we discovered that. The link I see is that we find the same thing. It doesn't show up completely here. OK, it does. That the number of connections the number of users in a network is the square root of the connections. Okay, the number of people using a mobile phone is the square root of the number of calls we can make to each other once. All right? So if there's two people, we can make two calls. If there are three people, we can make six calls. If there are 10 people, we can make 90 calls. There's a formula, n times n to the minus 1, which we simplify to n squared once we go into thousands and millions, because it's too much bother to, to register that one difference. So that could be an intuitive leap, and that could be an inspiration for another finding. Logic, which resides at the, you know, all over our mind, logic will take you from A to B, but imagination will take you anywhere. And I hope the imagination of the people in this room will take us to many places. Thank you very much.